Snap Judgment Studios. Get a behind-the-scenes look at Comedy Central's The Daily Show on Beyond the Scenes, an original podcast from The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. Every week, host Roy Wood Jr. goes deeper with notable guests and experts from the Emmy Award-winning series, and together, they use comedy to tackle current topics, from gentrification to gun laws, and take a closer look at how and why these topics matter. Listen to Beyond the Scenes from The Daily Show with Trevor Noah on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. New episodes every Tuesday. Attention shoppers, we now have Taste in the Bread Aisle, Dave's Killer Bread. That's right, an organic bread that's no longer a sedative for your taste buds. Dave's Killer Bread is on a mission to make the most of the loaf, to rid the world of GMOs, high fructose corn syrup, and artificial ingredients, and plant the seeds of good in all that they bake. Killer taste, killer texture, always organic. Dave's Killer Bread. Bread Amplified. Listen to episodes of Spooked only on Luminary, a subscription podcast network with original shows from your favorite creators. For example, Trevor Noah, Lena Dunham, Hanna Baba, and so many more. You can get a subscription for as little as two ninety nine a month with their annual plan, plus a seven day free trial to get started. Visit luminarypodcast.com to start your free trial. Not available in all markets and subject to local currency. Terms apply. Here's the story. As a little kid, I loved the Brady Bunch. To me, I don't know the Brady Bunch, but I loved them. And my favorite episode is when the whole family flies to Hawaii, right? Bobby finds a tiki figure at the construction site and gives it to Greg for good luck in the surfing competition. I straight scream at the TV, shout at Greg Brady, no, no, don't wear that thing in the ocean, fool, don't do it. And you better believe, little me weeps when that wave crashes over Greg and the screen straight fades the credits episode over, I weep. Real tears I cry for Greg, for Bobby, for Jan, Cindy, Marsha. But I learned a valuable lesson. Not that you don't wear a mysterious tiki around your neck. Every idiot knows that. No, no, no. I learned that some people you can't teach. Some people, they have to learn the hard way. And this is what I tell the children. Gathered round the campfire, eyes fixed on me, innocence. They don't know from Greg Brady. They don't know Jan, Marsha. How are they supposed to know about Marsha? They don't know from Marsha. They don't know how hard it is to give people warnings. Warnings that things are not as they seem. Warnings that there is so much to this world we don't understand. Warnings that evil lurks and our only protection is knowledge passed down information that must be shared or forgotten forever and that's why I ask them to gather sticks that's why I showed them to arrange those sticks in a pyramid fashion with just a little kindling nestled right at the base that children is where the fire starts and that is also where our stories begin <laughs> Get ready, because Snap Judgment, in partnership with Luminary, the subscription podcast network, we proudly present Campfire Tales. The stories we are afraid to share, but need to tell anyway. My name is Glenn Washington. Roasted marshmallows are just going to have to wait, because you're listening to Snap Judgment. Snap. 
we begin. With another hard lesson, Joe Panohu. Joe is determined to come at things his very own way. Spooked. My friends and I, we love to go cruising around the island. We love to go to places that are far away, that are adventurous. And it's about five o'clock in the afternoon. It was actually just me and another one of my friends. We drive all the way down and we park on the side of the road right outside this cave. And we cross the two lane highway. It's a little small entrance, but it's very vertical, less than 10 feet wide, but closer to 30 to 40 feet high. We walk into this crevice and it becomes a cave. Straight in the back, you look, there's a little hole, and then you look up, and it looks like there's a ledge and the cave goes a little bit further back. It's a cave that has these lava tubes that go all the way down and up and all around. We want to go to the top. We're looking for where the cave reaches the water. But we're afraid that we're not prepared for it. We decide that we're going to come back later more prepared. There's four of us that are interested in going now. And we go into the cave because there's been a lot of stories in this cave. We want to check out the legend of the Nauwe. He lured people into the water, according to legend, and turned into a shark and then swimming out of the cave and eating them. And it's said to be a place where the Hawaiian mafia at one time used the cave to dispose of their victims. We come back at about midnight. We brought rope. We brought water. We have our flashlights. We have everything that we need. The idea is that we don't know how long we're going to be in there. And... We go back into the cave, and the air is really still. The ground is all gravel and dirt, and there's a lot of cockroaches and bugs. People leave ho'okupu, or they leave offerings in the cave of food, and so it attracts a lot of bugs and stuff. There's no wind, there's no sound, there's no dripping of anything. And we look up to where we're planning on going, We see now on the right, there's a small little ledge that we can actually walk up. So we decide, yeah, we don't need the rope. We're going to do that. I'm the first one up. And I turn around and I look at my friends and I'm like, you guys ready to go? Make sure everybody gets up there all right. And then I get down on all fours and start crawling. I'm crawling into the cave and... We're going down in a single file line. So I'm in the lead, and they're all behind me. And the lava rock is really just sharp. My knees are all bust up. And we're all cut up. Claustrophobia just started kicking in. I notice blood is running down a little bit on my forehead. Um, The thought occurs to me now that... We're surrounded by millions of tons of rock. And if one small cave-in happens, we're stuck. You know, we have no way out. And it's likely we could die if we can't find an exit, which we don't even know if there is one. I remember crawling further down and further down and further down until finally my friends in the back, I hear somebody yell, Joe, let's go. This isn't fun anymore. Let's go. I tell them, okay. And I I shine the flashlight in front of me and I see a little area. It looks like the cave opens up and it levels off. And so I'm shining my light down there and I tell them, okay, hey, you know what? Let's go just to this place right up in front of us. If this is the place we're looking for, cool. But then we're just going to go here and then turn back. So I start crawling a bit more. 
with my flashlight shining in front of me. And as I'm crawling down, this figure just crosses over from the left to the right. Really fast, I, I, it registers that there was somebody there, but I can't see what it was. I'm like, oh, there's a logical explanation for this. This is probably just a homeless guy. But I'm not going to let my friends know that. And so I, I kind of play it up a little bit till I'm like, oh, oh, guys, I just saw something over there. I just saw something walk in front of my flashlight beam. And they're like, what? What did it look like? I don't know what it looked like, but something just walked from the left to the right. And so everybody wants to see, of course, at a safe distance. We don't want to go there. We just want to look. And now I'm lying flat into the lava rock and my friends are on me. I got one friend lying on my back and if you can imagine like all of our heads are like just all above each other and we're all just staring down the lava tube for like two minutes. We're staring and waiting and waiting for something to happen and nothing does and so my friends are like oh you know you sure you saw something and I'm like yeah yeah I saw something and I walked from the left to the right and then as we're looking it appears again from the right to the left but instead of walking through the flashlight beam to the other side of it it stops right smack in the middle and turns and faces us what the heck is that it looked like a humanoid but it does not have the shape of a human the head is fused into the shoulder this thing looking back at us had these red eyes that are burning it didn't have pupils it's just a very dark red and it's just looking at us and so we are booking it now my friends are in front of me and I'm just terrified because my friends can't move fast enough. I'm yelling at them. My friend in front of me, I'm trying to bite his foot. I'm hitting his foot. I'm telling them, hurry up. Because as I'm yelling at him, I hear and feel the presence behind me getting closer. I hear scratching noise. I hear something shuffling behind us and it's getting closer and it's closer and it's coming closer and I'm freaking out. And it may have taken us 45 minutes to get down, but it took us about five minutes or less to get out. And that was uphill. We get out and we're like, we're just booking it. I'm running down the ledge and I just decide to jump halfway. One of my friends decides to jump a little higher up, ends up spraining his ankle. So I'm getting out of the cave and I'm helping my friend. I get to my car. My friends are in their car in front of us. I close all the doors. I lock all the doors and I go to start the car up and the car's dead. I try to turn on the headlights. The battery's dead. Nothing is starting up. And so we're just kind of looking at each other, freaking out. We decide the heck with it. I'm leaving my car here. I get into my friend's car and I help my friend get into my friend's car in front of us. I tell him, all right, let's get the heck out of here. Let's go. He's trying to start it and nothing is happening. There's no noise. There's no sound. There's no starter kicking out. There's nothing. Everybody is yelling at the same time. Everybody is panicking. And all of a sudden something changes and shifts and I look out the window and all of my friends are looking out the window at the same time nobody will say a word the moon came out the clouds blew away and the whole area is now covered in moonlight I can see everything I can see straight to the cave I can see across the road, down the road and I also see this figure this shape kind of shambling out of the cave as I watch this thing come out of the cave it's it's shuffling almost like its right leg is injured and it still has these red eyes that are burning it's fire it's just a very dark red fire and I watch this thing walk 
to the road and its skin looks like it's covered in scabs. It gets to the middle of the road and it stops right on the middle line separating the two lanes and it just glares at us. It felt like it was looking at me. My brain is frozen. At that point, we're helpless. We're waiting for something to happen. It just stares at us and then slowly turns around and walks back into the cave. I got a feeling that it was telling us Kapu. Kapu is keep out. Basically, it scared the bejesus out of us as a warning. I have a feeling that those caves have something in it, and this thing may have been a guardian or a protector. And to explore it as a bunch of teenagers is very disrespectful. You know, this thing came across the street. It could have done anything to us. It didn't. It settled with stopping and looking at us and then going back into the cave. These are the good spirits. The good spirits are the ones that will scare the pants off of you. The bad spirits are the ones saying, Come, don't worry, don't be afraid of me. Come closer. Let me come closer. state for the record that I am afraid and I will stay away. I'm not trying to get tied up with any ancient deities, but I want to thank my friend Joe for venturing into the cave and coming face to face with the divine. The original score for that piece was by Lauren Newsom. It was produced by Annie Nguyen and Greta Weber. Don't you go anywhere, snappers, because after the break, buckle up. We're going to get our kicks on Route 666. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Snap Judgment, the Campfire Tales episode my name is Glenn Washington, and this week we're going to bring you stories from Spooked, our sister podcast created in the dark of night in partnership with Luminary, a subscription podcast network. And our next story comes to us from the dark of night, from the road. And when you're driving down that dark and lonely road, with the wind howling, the mist swirling, the rain pouring down from the sky, when do you decide that you don't want to see what's around the bend? Hi, my name is Michael Kilpatrick. I'm a musician, a full-time musician. And I was playing a gig in Huntsville, Alabama. And I had a great show. Went to the bar. Thanked everybody for having us. Gave everybody hugs and kisses. And on the way out, one of the guys from the bar goes, Hey, Mike. Hey, man. You really want to pay close attention to the weather, man. It's starting to get bad. I think the storm's going to get bad. With that, my girl Karen and I hopped into the red Honda Accord. And we were off to Birmingham. This is a drive that I have done many, many, many times over my life. So this is just a normal drive for me. We'd been driving about 30 minutes. It's 1.30 in the morning. 
and it's very, very dark, very windy, and starting to rain a little bit. And we made a right turn onto a very, very small two-lane highway that runs 30 miles out of Huntsville, Alabama. Once we turned onto the two-lane road, the atmosphere just felt different around us. I rolled the windows down. Oddly enough, the weather was extremely calm. There was no rain. There was virtually no wind. There were no lights on anywhere around. You ever heard the expression, calm before the storm? That's sort of what it felt like. And I changed the tape player over to the radio to tune in an AM station to find out if there were any weather bulletins. We'd been on the two-lane road for maybe 10 minutes. Up ahead, I see some headlights coming toward us, which is rare for this time of night on this two-lane road. I start to slow the car a little bit. We're maybe 500 yards away, and the closer I get to them, we notice that the headlights are arranged vertically rather than horizontally. As we neared the car, I lowered the window. We realize that we're actually looking at a perfectly pristine car. It's a dark-colored SUV. It looked like it was just off the showroom floor, and it was just sitting on its passenger side. And the engine was running. And the interior lights were on. All the running lights were on. The windshield wipers in this car were on. And the strangest thing was the driver's side door was wide open, somehow defying gravity. And at this point, I yelled out, Does anybody need any help? Is everybody okay? Hello? Hello? I looked at Karen and I said, something's bad wrong here. There's this car, it's been in some sort of an accident, but there's no damage to the vehicle whatsoever. The car is completely pristine. Nothing wrong. There's no broken glass. There's no skid marks. There's no debris. The car just looks like it's been set on its side and abandoned. Karen said, this just feels funny. I feel like either someone might be watching us or someone is waiting for us to get out. I just got a really bad feeling, just a sinking feeling in in my stomach that something was really, really wrong. Karen said... Let's just go. Let's just go move along. We continued on, and we sort of felt like the worst of the storm probably had passed, so we felt like we could just get back up to speed and ignore this anomaly and just keep going and get back to Birmingham. Well, we've been driving about five minutes and still kind of rattled by what we'd seen, but we sort of had put it out of our minds, and we just concentrated on the drive and we're making small talk when we came around another corner and around that corner we saw some tail lights but the closer we got to them we realized they were the tail lights of yet another SUV This car looked different. It was also a dark-colored SUV, but it was more red or maroon. The closer we got to it, we realized that this SUV was on its roof. I 
I didn't have a cell phone or I would have called 911 myself. I lowered the passenger side window where Karen was, and we both just stopped and looked out. The car is upside down in a very, very shallow ditch right next to the side of the road. I heard the windshield wipers of the car moving. The engine was on. The interior lights were on. None of the doors of the car were open. But it just seemed like a perfectly normal car flipped on its top. No scratches. No broken glass. No broken anything. Karen, you call him. She just said, Hello? Anybody there? Anyone around? Need any help? Hello? Hello? Karen turned to face me, and it seemed like the color was starting to drain out of her face. She has a much cooler head than I do. And if she was upset, then I knew I needed to be upset. We had been sitting there a couple of moments, and then we just decided we need to get out of here. There's something really, really, really bad here. I pressed the accelerator pretty hard and just said, what is going on here? Karen didn't say a word. We had not passed another car. We had not passed another living soul on this road, and we've now been on the road 15 minutes. Well, way up ahead, I noticed something in the road, and it looked like the road was covered in, like, white-colored gravel, like hailstones. And the closer we got to it, I realized that these hailstones were moving. And they were as far as the eye could see in all directions. So I got a little closer, and the closer I got to them, I realized that they weren't hailstones at all. They were frogs. Tiny, tiny frogs. Maybe just a little bit bigger than a 50 cent piece. Every square inch of that road and the shoulder of the road were covered with these hopping frogs everywhere. The whole road looked like it was moving in front of me. I pulled the car to a stop. I lowered the windows. We heard no noises. It was as though God turned off the audio of the world. We didn't hear the frogs. They made no noise. We heard nothing but the sound of my engine. No wind, no rain. No radio, no breathing, we heard nothing. And all we could see were these frogs everywhere we looked. And they continued on up the road as far as we could see. Just hopping around on this wet pavement. Thousands upon thousands of them. Just everywhere I reached over put my hand on Karen's knee and said I don't know what this is but it feels like the plague she said nothing my heart was in my throat I kind of felt my hands shake 
I don't think I've ever been more frightened in my life. I've been through some frightening experiences, but nothing like this. I glanced at Karen and she was motionless, just staring, staring at the frogs. I looked at Karen and I said, we can't stay here. We have to keep going. And for just a moment, the animal lover in me said, well, I can't run these frogs down. I can't run over these frogs, these poor frogs. Whatever they're doing here, I don't know. But we got to get out of here. So I went ahead and continued on. Once we're driving, I'm hearing the frogs as they jump hit the side of our car. I'm hearing very, very small thumps against the front, the sides, the doors, very small thumps. And the frogs just kept coming. And we continued down this road. We've gone another mile, another two miles, another three miles, and these frogs are still everywhere, all around us. We're running over them. They're in front of us. They're behind us. They're on the sides. They're just everywhere. They're just like a chorus of thumps, tiny thumps against the car. Very, very unsettling to say the least to know that I was killing these frogs by running over them, but I had to get out of there. Four miles I'd gone, and the frogs sort of tapered off. After we passed through the frogs, and it looked like they were behind us, I just pressed the accelerator hard. And I was probably 20 miles over the speed limit. I just wanted to get as far away from them as I could. I kept driving another 10 minutes. And I reached the interstate, which I need to get on to get back to Birmingham. And I see that there's one gas station right at the freeway entrance. And so I pull in, hoping to just sort of shake my head and just kind of make sense of what happened. Well, I slide the car into the, into the parking lot of the gas station, pull up in a parking space, And I immediately wanted to jump out to see what the car looked like. Karen hopped out the passenger side. I hopped out my side. The first thing I did was look at the exterior of the vehicle. I just felt more than a little unsettled. Because not only had we seen what we'd seen and driven through what we'd driven through, I saw no outward evidence on the car that we'd been through anything like this. It was just a wet car on a wet road on a wet night in rural Alabama. Thank you, Michael, for sharing your story with the spooked. How very relieved we are that you made it back from the Twilight Zone. Original score for that story is by Leon Morimoto. It was produced by Annie Nguyen.
Now, let me ask you a question. Did you ever experience the inexplicable? Did you ever hear the shouts of the unseen or see that which should never have been? You see, there are some stories you may not want to tell your spouse, your friends, or your family, but if you can't tell them, Snappers, you can tell me. We want to hear your stories. Your stories make spooked spooked. So let us know. Spooked at snapjudgment.org. And I promise we'll only tell if you want us to tell. And after the break, we're headed to a famous lighthouse to meet a man that lives there all alone. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Snap Judgment, our Campfire Tales episode. My name is Glenn Washington, and this week, we're bringing you stories from Spook, a supernatural podcast created in partnership with Luminary. Now, we're traveling to a small coastal town in Maine. This place is called Lubbock. It's the easternmost town in the United States of America. And once you're there, you better get comfortable because it's over 100 miles to the next city. Bubba. Bubba's lived there his whole life and in his 20s, Bubba worked at the town's famous lighthouse, manned by the U.S. Coast Guard. For four years, Bubba was in charge of a small crew that kept watch and shifts. Their job? Never, ever let the light go out. Here's Bubba. And the light, there's no other light, lighthouse like it. The horizontal red and white stripes, 13 all together. It's, a, you know, the flag of the colonial days. My name is George Eden. I'm 63 years old. I live in Lubeck, Maine. Left here in 1974 after high school to join the Coast Guard and put 26 years in the Coast Guard. If you guys wasn't here today, I wouldn't be in this house. I will not be in the house alone. Believe it or not, I can't never be alone the rest of my life. It is like isolated, you know, there's bears down there, there's coyotes, there's wildlife. I seen, honest to God, I seen a mountain lion down there. We gotta go 50 miles to go to Walmart. We gotta go 50 miles to go to a movie. Well, that road is a winding, you know, winding, you know, it's a dangerous road. Thicker fog down there at night, you, you, could, you could go off the road very, very easily. Duty was, was uh, two days on, two days off, then the weekend off. But you got to remember that you're on there for two days. You got to give the you got to give the weather report every four hours. You got to time the light, and then you got to make sure the fog is going. Somebody might be drowning out there, falling overboard. So you're constantly watching the ocean too. You always had that feeling like somebody was either looking at you or, or standing behind you or something like that. There was a presence there that felt. It was, it was like a dark presence, an evil presence. For somebody that is not used to a rural setting, like, like Lubeck, and they come from a city and get stationed down there, I, I've had a couple, it, it, it was a shocker for them. I come in one morning, and a guy wanted to commit suicide. He was up on the light, you know, facing the ocean, and he locked the door to, to get up there, and he, he, he uh, you know, wanted to jump off the, uh, the lighthouse kill himself. So I had to call the medical center and come down and, and they took him out in a straight jacket. And he was kicking, yelling, screaming and, and I just kept asking him, what happened to you? What happened to you? How did you get to this state of mind? And, uh, and then, I, then this guy named Bradley, his, he was from Lubeck. So he had trouble. He was scared. He was scared. He was scared to stay there. He, had, he, could, he, he wouldn't handle it. So one night I come down to check on him and I went down over the hill and all the lights were on. 
all the lights. It's like, what the heck? And then I get, get closer down there, I see his car and all the windows and everything was smashed out of his car. His tail lights, his headlights, they was all smashed out. Glass all over the road. I'm going, man, somebody did that to him and you know, we're gonna get the bottom of it. So I went in the I went in the light and hollered, hey Bradley, 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 where are you? And I, I then I, you know, I said, are you in the bathroom? Open the door up right now, I'm gonna kick it in. Well, you opened it up like this. Honest to God, there was a mattress and a pillow right by the flush. He had a gun, he had a knife, he had an ax. And he's just like this, right? Like, like he was in horror. <laughs> he, he was, he was like, he's, like he's seen a ghost. And I'm, I'm looking at him, it ain't funny. I'm looking at him and go, what happened to you? What happened to you? What happened to your vehicle? Your vehicle's all spent. He goes, honest to God, I looked out the window and there was 12 people in cloaks and they had sticks and they was going around my car they smashing it up. I said, okay, uh, where'd they go? Out? Did you see where they went? They just vanished in the woods. I said, okay, all right. So I got him out there and got him a cup of coffee and he was shaking and everything like that. And, and uh, he, he, was, he, was, he was scared right to death. I called the medical center again and had to come down and take him off, off the straight jacket. I went through. I went through about ten people down there. It was hard enough to get somebody down there to stand that kind of duty. A lot of people can't do that. A lot of people can't be alone. And and if you're there all alone, I can see being scared. I was scared. I was scared. I wasn't happy going out there every four hours at night. I wasn't scared of the animals. I was scared of maybe seeing something else. That's what I was scared of. When it started getting dark outside, I felt it. I felt you know I this, you know it, it was the worst feeling for me. You know, I'm the only one here. I'd hear a spoon and a, and, a, and a cup. I said, geez, who's drinking coffee out there? And I'd listen to it for a while. I was right by the kitchen in my bedroom. And I could hear it. I could hear drawers opening up and all that. You know, my bed was situated so I'd look right at the, at the uh, door to see if the doorknob would be turning. I was armed. I never slept all night. I did during the day. I, I would during the day, but not at night. That's how crazy I was. I put up on the doors. I put up like bells and stuff, because um, I, I really wanted to hear somebody trip, uh, you know, hit one of them. You know what I mean? I really, I really wanted to hear that. I figure if they're coming, they'll come to me, and uh, and I'll be ready for them. I remember it was a, it was a clear day. It was a beautiful day out. You know, that, of course, I had the duty. I don't think anybody came down and visit. I had visits every, almost every day. Nobody came down that day, which was odd. I see the wind change. It was southwest. And I said, here we go again. Southwest could be, could be thick of fog down here tonight. I mean thick. Well, I looked out the window about 10 o'clock at night and couldn't even see your car. That's how thick it was. And that makes you nervous, too. I, uh, at 10 o'clock, I think I went to bed around 10 o'clock, something like that, but I'm in there, laying down and all that, and I just, just get in bed and I heard this banging on the door. I'm going, hmm, who the hell, who'll be coming down here at 10 o'clock at night? Could, it must be, must be one of my friends or something wants to come in and say hello, but they never come down at 10 o'clock at night before. So I hear, the, I keep hearing the banging. It wasn't loud, this banging, you know? So I said, well, must be somebody in distress. So I, I, I start, I'm in the kitchen now. I go out through the door and I, I see the shape of, I see the shape of somebody. I open up the door and there's this woman standing there, this, this, this like this, you know. And she had this, 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 this dress was like a, it was like a Civil War dress. It was kind of gray and white and all that. And I'm looking at her and she's, I mean, she's. As soon as I seen her eyes, it's like she's looking right through me. She was, looks like she was in, I won't say terror, but she was, we well, not a happy person. I was scared. I, right, as soon as I, as soon as I went out the door, it's like, like that, and, and my heart was pounding, and I just said, I mean, I help and she was, yes, I have to use the bathroom. She, she sounded like a, like a, like a, uh, 
a really soft, soft voice, really soft, like a squeaky voice. And I said, yeah, and, and you, know, I'm gonna, you know, I'm a quiz to person. I was going to ask her a hundred questions. But all of a sudden, I just, felt, I just got this feeling like I got to, you know, she wants to use the bathroom. That's her priority, you know, and, okay, no problem. So I, I told her, yeah, the bathroom's right over here. Well, guess what? She walks by me. She goes, I know where it is. You do? She walks by me, opens up the door to where it, and that freaked me out. And I and I said, you must be here, be, been here before. And she didn't ask me. Well, she started going up the stairs, and I turned the light on. And she, could, I watched her go right up the stair, and I'm kind of looking up there, make sure that she's in the bathroom all right. She's in the bathroom, no light comes on the whole time. I'm going, you've got to be kidding me. And I, that's when I went. I think I either got to face the music here or run the hell out of here and get, and get my truck and take off. That's what I should have done. Well, anyway, I backed off and went, went out, the, you know, the kitchen's right there, and here she comes. And she comes down, she walks right out the, right out the door, and when she, come, when she come out of that door downstairs, she didn't even look at me. She didn't even look at me. She went right by me like that. And I told her, I said, i got to ask her a couple of questions. She didn't even ask me. She went right out the door, and in and, and her thick of fog, she went right out. So I went out. I went out because I told her, I, I started yelling. I said, ma'am, you're going the wrong way because the, the cliff was there. That was it. She, she then disappeared in the fog. So Raymond T., the next morning, I went and got him. I said, Raymond, this woman came in here last night. She didn't look like so, something I've seen before. Well, then he told me he's seen her over there a few years back. And I said, oh, I said, so what do you think, Raymond? He goes, it's a ghost. I, I wish now I would have touched her. I, I wish I would have just went like that and touched her to see to see if, if there was any kind of reaction or something like that. And I, I just started thinking all these things that why did she come in to see me? Why, I mean, why me? Why not somebody else? Uh, was she safe with me? I don't know. She had to, I think she had to be, um, I don't know. She, she, something happened there. She either, something happened. I, I, you know, I, I, believe, I do believe she died down there. Something, she might have died there. She might have died at sea. You know, she might have gotten lost. She looked, like, she looked like a lost soul to me. That's what it looked like to me. Like I said, my last two years was, was very, very difficult because I really thought I'd see her again. I've dreamed of her. I have dreamed of that woman. It's the same thing. She walks by me, turns around, walks out. Every dream, every dream is the same thing. Walks, this goes up there, goes out. Then I wake up. And I, you know, even, even today, I have a light on my, uh, every night, a little light there, that's all, so that I feel safe. Bubba, for manning the light, keeping everyone safe for so many years. We're glad you don't have to be down there anymore. The original score for that story was by Clay Xavier. It was produced by Greta Weber and Galen Cock. It happened again. And if you missed even a moment, get the amazing Snap Judgment Podcast. Subscribe the Snap Podcast that transports you into another time, another place, and sometimes another world. And know this, a brand new season of amazing spook storytelling drops, an all new spook season released weekly now through Halloween on luminarypodcast.com. Be afraid. The 
Campfire Tales episode is brought to you by the team that never wears a jacket on those dark stormy nights. I don't know why. I don't know why, but flee in terror. If you happen to see Mr. Mark Ristich, Anna Sussman, our chief spookster is Eliza Smith, Lauren Newsom, Renzo Gorio, Chris Hambrick, Annie Nguyen, Leon Morimoto, Teo Ducat, Marissa Dodge, Aaliyah Yates, Zoe Ferrigno, Greta Weber, Jacob Winnick, Tiffany DeLiza, Ann Ford, Fernando Hernandez, and Flo Wiley. The spook theme song is by Pat Masidi Miller. My name is Glenn Washington, and understand this is not the news. No way is this the news. In fact, you could wake up from your nightmare and realize you're still in your nightmare. And even then, you would still, still not be as far away from the news as this is. But this is P.R. If you enjoyed these campfire tales, join us over at Luminary for the latest dose of spooked. Go to luminarypodcasts.com to start your free trial. See you there.